I, I'm just checking to see that um, I think most people are here, so I think we can make a start. It's um, half, half past one, or thereabouts. Uh, yes, half past one. Um, so, so welcome um, to Primary Care Commissioning Committee. Uh, we are in April, I think, to think about that one. Um, and um, I have taken um, a chair's uh, action um, that involves quite a few different contracts. And I'm just going to list them out just so that it's clear in the minutes as to what action has been taken. Um, they're all in relation to existing contracts that have been extended. Um, so so, so the, 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 the first, first two has been extended for 12 months with the option to review after six is the improved access contracts and the locally commissioned service contracts. Um, other contracts that have been extended to 31st of March 2022 includes the um, One Norwich Prime Provider contract, the West Norfolk 24-hour ECG and RSS contract, uh, the pharmacy anticipatory prescribing, uh, West Norfolk has a small interpretation co interpreting contract, um, the Mid Norfolk PCN Home Visiting Service, the Norwich Vulnerable Adults, um, in addition to that, um, the, with the EMT, it's been agreed that the quarter one payments um, will continue as currently for the Beaufort Village contract and the North, Norfolk Enhanced Care Home contract. Um, these are all really to give um, the team time to review existing arrangements and try and um, make things uh, sort of more equal across the patch. But obviously with COVID um, and staff pressure, some of this work couldn't be done before the 31st of March um, that has just gone. So uh, things have been rolled over to buy us a bit more time to come up with a coherent service for Norfolk and Waveney across the patch. Um, I think that's enough list of the list from, from me. I haven't missed anything out, have I? Excellent. I had to scratch my head to make sure I got them all right. Um, so we move on to apologies. We've got apologies from Kath Byford, Tony Goodson, Mel Benfield, um, Jill Jones and Mark Burgess. I don't think there's any other um, I've missed. Uh, on to declarations of interest. I just remind everybody to keep their um, declarations up to date and um, to, to let Sarah um, or Martin Fitz know if there's been any changes in your declarations. And are there any declarations in relation to agenda items this afternoon um, for this part one meeting? I'm not aware of any, but if we come to, come to it and it suddenly strikes any of you, there's a conflict, please um, shout. Um, on to the minutes of the last meeting. Um, are there any um, queries in terms of accuracy um, in the minutes? No. Um, and are there any items that are matters arising that's not on the agenda? Nope. Um, that's great. Thank you very much. And then we move on to the action log. Um, the first two items has been closed um, for the minute signing and the forward a planner was sent out. Um, and uh, the, the, the next item was about breaking down the GP forward view that's taken place in the finance report for this meeting. So I think we can close that after this meeting. Um, and the revised term of reference um, that is due to go to the governing body, um, I think is probably the public meeting in May. So I think we'll just leave that on the um, action log until we've had a governing body approval of the amendments. Um, I hope that's okay. Um, moving rapidly forward to the forward planner. Um, Sadie, uh, can I pass it to you? Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, as you can see, this was um, this was a proposed planner for the, this new financial year, which we've already 
um, got some red um, showing on. Um, and I will just highlight to you that the spotlight item on the annual or biannual report on delegation should have also been highlighted in, in red. Um, I mean, given that um, we've already had to delay a couple of items due to um, uh, our continued pandemic response, I think it might be sensible if members are in agreement that we um, we restart the planner um, in from the May meeting, assuming um, that we can uh, receive our normal items of business um, at the May meeting um, so that we we're not because otherwise we'll consistently have red marked because we'll always be a month uh, a month behind. So if members are happy with that, um, I'd like to suggest that that change. I think so. I think I think obviously, obviously you know, operationally, if um, things change, then and it's not doable, then obviously we will understand. But I think we need to aim to get back to some sort of business as usual, if possible. Yes, I completely agree. So no pressure then, Sadie. Thank you very much. Um, on to the risk register. Um, are you taking this one, Sadie? Yes, thank you. Um, I think um, I focused on the red risks um, for today. Um, we have four of those. Um, I'll go, go through them one by one. Um, so the first one is PC3, um, which is in relation to the locally commissioned services program. And um, you've already given a very comprehensive update on um, where we are at with that, Doris, with, by, by going through your list. Um, but essentially, we have um, protected quarter one payments to general practice. Um, and um, we are um, about to begin discussions with the local medical committee about quarters two to four within this financial year. Um, and um, following rapidly on from that, we will continue um, with our work programme to um, develop our approach from the 1st of April 2022. So as we start to recover normal um, business within the CCG and um, within the NHS, the wider NHS, uh, this, this is going to be one of our major projects for this um, financial year. So I hope that we'll be able to bring you a more comprehensive update on progress to the next committee meeting. Um, but yeah, we are um, finance colleagues and I met this morning to start um, our planning for this uh, as well. So um, while we haven't changed the risk yet, there are green shoots um, around the progress of the, the LCS um, programme. Um, so moving on to PC6, which is the learning disability health checks uh, risk. Um, as reported in the, um, the update, we do now have a peripatetic team in place in Norwich. Um, we have, Parveen and I met yesterday with um, Sarah Jane Ward, um, who's one of the associate directors in the quality team, um, to really start trying to finalise the plan around that peripatetic team and the deliverables um, for the next few months. Uh, we know that data quality issues remain um, and um, we've got some support from our digital team colleagues on um, working directly with practices to try and get um, underneath underneath that and, the, and, and prepare some supportive um, approaches for everybody else as well. Um, and um, we're currently working through the final data for, from the last financial year so that hopefully for the next meeting we'll be able to give you a final position um, for 2020-2021 um, and of course we did have the NHS England um, locally commissioned service which came in in February to further incentivise um, health checks and vaccinations. Um, so you know, again, um, a, a, a very challenging piece of work, but with the focus on 
health inequalities throughout the planning guidance for the NHS um, and the continuing um, investment in general practice through the COVID expansion support fund. Um, we, uh, we're, we're hoping that we will now um, be able to get a better grip on this programme um, for taking it forward. I'll pause there. I think there's a hand up. Um, Bill, did you want to come in? Yes, uh, I, I just wanted to get a sense of how um, how long it will take us to get back to a, the target score. Um, uh, I understand you were saying that we will come back in May to have a look at this and look at the plan, but I wondered what the ambition was. I mean, it is a relatively small cohort of people who are extremely vulnerable. Um, so, it, you know, it, 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 it should be um, something that we could get back on track relatively quickly. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm, I'm going to answer this, but then I'm going to also ask Parveen, who's been leading the programme, just to add in any further comments that I may miss. Um, so the pre-pandemic, the, um, the target uptake for this year had been, oh sorry, for last year, now that we're in April, had been 75%, um, percent, which had never been reached as a whole um, in Norfolk and Waveney. Um, and um, that was revised this year to reflect the pandemic to, I think, 67 or 68 percent, but Parveen will confirm. Um, the, the anecdotal reports from general practice to us around this had been that the stay at home message had worked rather too well um, amongst um, the LD community. Um, and um, and therefore it it was even more challenging than normal um, to try and um, provide um, the full health check to people. And that was reflected in some of the national guidance, which allowed, if clinically appropriate, the physical face to face element of the check to be put aside just while we were um, in the, the height of the, the pandemic. So I'll just ask Parveen if there's anything else she'd like to add to what I've just said on that. Thank you, Sadie. You've covered all of the, the main points. So this year's target because of the pandemic from 75% um, is down to 67%. And like Sadie said, from the, the evidence that we're getting back and the feedback we're getting back from practices, um, the stay at home message ha has worked rather well uh, and a lot of these patients are, are also shielding. So the, the national letters were also strongly recommending that, that they stay at home. Um, from the Norwich Peripatetic team, that's a known place. One of the ways that we're going to try and increase the target rapidly is by doing home visiting um, to try and um, carry out the health checks in a different way to see whether that actually helps performance uh, and uptake. Um, Thank you for that. Do we have any idea of the time frame, which was my other question? So um, many practices actually carry out their health checks in the final um, quarter of the the year. So um, we are, um, Parveen has um, discussed this as part of the, with her team as part of the operational planning guidance, and we are trying to encourage through this work for this programme to be spread out a, a little bit more evenly um, across the year. But certainly in terms of um, our understanding of what happened in last year and reporting that data, um, if we get it before the next committee, I'm really happy to, to circulate that round um, to members. Could, could I just add, Sadie, so Q4's data, uh, the NHS regional data probably won't get released till uh, normally it's the end of June, early July, before we get the NHS regional data. We'll obviously get the Q4 business intelligence data, which is our own internal data that our own teams pull up from the, the clinical systems, which always shows um, a lot better performance than the regional reporting. But, we, but it's this coding and data cleansing issue because it's the regional figures that get shown on a national platform. Um, Tracy, did you want to come in as well? 
Yeah, I, I was just going to say I concur with that. I mean, it has been very challenging when, our, our, you know, our learning those patients of ours with a learning disability haven't wanted to come to the surgeries and come out. We've wanted to keep them safe. But I do think that generally primary care over the past maybe two to three months has made a real kind of focus to try to get people to come in and support them to do that. And I think certainly from my experience in practice, you know, with the COVID vaccination program, we have taken opportunities to kind of, you know, integrate and do some health checks in that respect and then kind of, you know, support people to come back for that, that learning disability health check appointment. So there's things happening and I do think there's opportunities over the, the summer months, perhaps with PCNs working together in an integrated way and kind of supporting each other to undertake the check. So I think there's there will be lots happening, Bill, so hopefully we can report some positive progress to you soon. <laughs> I think it's difficult, isn't it, when especially when um, historically it's been um, everything's been done towards the end of the financial year. I mean, I have noticed actually the take up has gone up from I think it was running at about 20 odd percent in the last report that we had. You know, the, the, the one that that end up to February is now 49 um, percent. And it'll be interesting to see whether the additional payment for the vaccination as well linked to learning difficulties will in help to increase that uptake of health checks. It, I mean, it's something I know you're all conscious that we need to work on. Um, is, is part of the, um, where in, in Yarmouth at the Paget where they've got the use of um, the sort of on-site but off-site room where it's slightly more um, homely environment. Has that also been used for you doing health checks um, when people come in for vaccinations? Do you know? I think the Paget service was um, a separate vaccination service. It was vaccinations only. Um, but we did um, we did share, we, we invited Rebecca Crossley, who's who's been the pioneer of the, this service. We invited her to one of our briefing meetings for the clinical directors and clinical leads of the CCG. And I think um, certainly I'm well aware that in West Norfolk, the PCNs actually did a very similar exercise to that. Um, and they um, were looking at it in a more holistic way and in, 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 in looking at the full um, range of, of check plus the vaccination for um, people with learning disabilities. So I think they've all taken on board elements of, of the best practice around vaccinations, but obviously tried to take an integrated approach where they where they can. It's probably something that we need to bear in mind if um, if there's going to be booster shots, you know, exactly. later on this year, that mm -hmm. it's kind of into an in, into integrated way. Um, but we will await with interest. Thank you. That answers your question as well, Bill. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, but um, I assume you would shout. Um, do you want to just carry on with the rest yes, of Yes, I will. And I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that Parveen's agenda item on learning disabilities may be a bit shorter later as a result of, um, of our discussion. Um, so the next red risk is um, uh, PC9, which is hypnotics and an anxiolytics. And I'm glad to see that Michael's here in case there are any questions. But just by way of um, a brief update, um, there were um, dependence forming medicine medicines working groups um, established in order to look at this and um, with uh, practices directly and those were paused um, over the the latest wave of the pandemic but those are now being restarted by the medicines management team and the medicines management team is also in the process of um, drafting the new prescribing quality scheme which will obviously have a focus on this um, area as well you, you you may remember that the um, previous pqs was extended to cover um, the first quarter of, of this financial year in recognition of the impact of the pandemic response um, over the winter period. Um, so we will we will get to see um, the new PQS at the committee and we'll be asked to approve it in in due course. Um, moving on to um, PC11. Um, 
This is the um, the risk which deals with um, both recovery, but also the interface um, between primary care and the rest of the system um, and the pressure that that has caused um, on general practice um, as the whole system has worked very differently um, over the last year. Um, and you'll see from the update, thanks thanks to the LMC who shared this with, uh, with us, there's been new national guidance uh, published around um, planning for the for the interface as part of uh, recovery planning and we have shared that with the CCG's planned care team who are um, reviewing that with with secondary care providers and I've asked them to provide us um, with an update on that uh, once they've had those discussions. Um, so um, I'm hoping that, that that will be positive and, and we've got a slide later, uh, some slides later on, on the agenda on recovery planning and operational guidance. So we'll, we'll be touching on that again later. And then and then finally, there's a proposed new risk highlighted in red um, on the register that you'll see PC15. Um, and this is linked to um, an estate's um, an estates programme and, and if you have any questions, Jason, I'm sure um, we'll be able to answer those. Um, essentially, uh, I'm just scrolling down to it now. Sorry, I'm trying to do all of this on one screen. Um, so there's about £25 million of capital funding linked into the Wave 4B um, primary care capital schemes. And um, the timeframes are, are, are pretty tight and have become even tighter as a result of the uh, pandemic response. So Paul Hyam, who's the Associate Director for Primary Care Estates, has, um, has proposed that we encapsulate this as a new risk on our register due to the scale of the investment and the time scales that, that we're dealing with. Uh, so if members are happy, We'll turn that into black print um, for the next uh, meeting and we'll continue to to update on that. Thank you very much, Sadie. Are there any questions for Sadie? Tracy? Um, in respect to the primary care hubs, I, I thought my recollection of what, what they were and what they were going to be was that there were kind of some that were more advanced plans than others. So I don't know if we perhaps might want to look opportunities to enhance some others because some were so, so far behind. I don't know. I'm sure we were doing that. But clearly, I know we we're at different stages in the localities with those plans, weren't we? Yes. Jason, did you want to come in? Yeah. Yeah, if you don't mind, Chair, thank you. Um, yeah, just in response to that, Tracy, the the localities have really been based on the demand and capacity work that um, our partners in all life have done. Um, so, so we tried to locate the the hubs in where the the most demand sits. And I, I shan't go through all, all of the hubs. I, I think there there was an update um, going to come to a, a future meeting, so we, we can go through that in detail at that at a future meeting. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think just linking to that point on um, on the risk register, I think it was um, PC2 about primary care estates risk, and there was a comment made about, um, you know, that there is a sort of delay in some of the returns, and will that impact this new risk in, in terms, or are they com two completely separate things? I think they're two separate things. Because this this is this um, way for B hubs are a, is a separate work stream, um, separate funding stream. Um, the other, we, we we continue to have the business as usual capital funding as well. So the delays in the PCN doesn't returns doesn't affect the hub. No, shouldn't do. Um, John, did you want to come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. But. I was just thinking the other way around, actually, the work that's been done on demand and capacity to support the, the rationale for the hubs that Jason just described does actually take us a, quite a long way further forward with our general primary care estate strategy anyway. So I think that it may be worth reviewing that risk with a view to that coming down, actually, PC2. Maybe, as Jason said, when we have a future paper on estates development. Thanks, John. Um, are there any other questions, comments on the risk register? No, thank you very much for that. Um, we move on to the finance report. 
Um, Jason, are you taking this? Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, so the finance report represents the month 11 position. Um, the month 12 position is still being worked on. Um, as as it's the uh, year end, we've got a slightly extended um, um, timetable to, to work on, so the, the figures aren't, aren't available for the, in time for the committee. So um, at, as at month 11, um, both year to date and for the forecast um, out term for the full year is, is, is a 0.7 million underspend. Um, this is predominantly driven by overspends in prescribing of 2.2 million um, due to no cheaper stock options and predominantly in sterilene, which is an antidepressant. But that, that overspend has been offset by underspends in local enhanced service costs resulting from the accounting treatment for treatment rooms um, and a net 1.5 million of reduction in delegated um, co-commissioning and PCIT um, costs, which benefited from the unwinding of prior year estimates, um, giving the net 0.7 million um, favourable underspend position. Um, as, as previously Oh, sorry, um, COVID costs have continued um, in the month of February in line with previous months and represent the staff costs for um, cover. And that's the, the only thing that we're, we're claiming now in, in relating to COVID costs. Um, on page seven of the, of the finance report, there's the GP forward view analysis, which was referred to as part of the actions. Um, this is also showing an underspend of circa 200,000. It's predominantly driven by some additional funding that we received from Health Education England, which we, which we weren't actually expecting when we put the plan together. Um, that's probably a potted summary. Um, I should open it up for any questions. Any questions for Jason? Um, Naomi. Hi Jason, thanks for that report and thank you for um, the action of putting the GP4 review money um, explicitly down, it's really helpful. Um, just wondered as there is an underspend, is, is that going to be rolled forward to next year? Um, not, we, all, we are looking at the moment at, at what our, our roll forward and what things we can accrue on, onto the balance sheet and that, that that's literally the process we're going through as we speak. The teams are working on that as we speak. We're, we're hoping to roll forward some some of the monies. Um, but it, it may not specifically be for, for these cheap, the underspends that you see on the slide, um, but in general there should be some available. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, thanks Chair. Uh, I don't have a question, but a request for future finance reports. Uh, it's good that indeed there's a breakdown of GP forward view spend, but the two big expenditure line items prescribing and delegated co-commissioning, uh, I would like to see a breakdown of both of them. I assume there is some logical way to pass that out. Um, so that's really my request. OK, yep, yeah, we'll, we'll look into that and uh, and if I if I work with you offline to 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 get the level of um, of breakdown that you, you need. It's fine, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I, and I know the sort of the forecast as shown here is the sort of the snapshot position when the papers were prepared and sent out. And obviously, you know, this isn't the final um, outturn figure, um, which we will hopefully see at the next meeting when um, the March figures are sort of, you know, they won't be forecast, there'll be the actual plus any approvals that's going to be put in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we will then know exactly where we are and then um, on to this, this year's finances as well. Um, thank you very much to you and team for your, the report. Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, I will move on. No. Um, on to the prescribing report from Michael. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll take the paper as read, but I'll I will just highlight a few things as you, as normal. Um, one big thing the CCG prescribing team are doing is working much closely, much more closely with the CSU team, who we're hoping to in-house very soon, and we're we're getting much better working relationships and communication going 
with them, which I think is yielding some useful results. Um, in terms of CCG prescribing performance, just the, my rough and ready um, uh, look at how we compare across the east of England is, is one of the things that I sort of look at first. And we're uh, fourth highest in the east of England, doesn't account for deprivation. February data came out yesterday and on that we've dropped down to fifth, which is, which is good news, although um, in the middle of the pack it, it, it is a, literally only pennies apart from the various organisations in terms of the um, average average cost of an item on a prescription um, normalised to a age and sex normalised patient, so taking account of differences in populations. There's the usual table on all the cost pressures, which are um, really quite large in terms of things that are not under our control, um, and broken down some of the top drugs there, sertraline, as um, Jason mentioned, has now gone up to nearly 2.4 million cost pressure. Price of that is now coming down. Um, we have been asking GPs not to use that one first line as there are other cheaper options. Um, so going forward, we'll try to avoid using those particular drugs. Dependence forming medicines. I've just had a meeting with the clinical directors over in West Norfolk and we're working on a on a plan of action um, because they're the they're the outlier on the third one there, which is our one of concern, hypnotics and anxiolytics, where we're the third highest in the country on that, which is driven a fair bit by activity in West Norfolk, which is historic, but is quite hard to undo. Um, and the trend is coming down. Antibiotic prescribing, I did just mention that in the West Norfolk Clinical Directors meeting as five, the top five out of six of our highest prescribers of broad spectrum antibiotics are also in the West. So um, hopefully I'm going to be invited to their PCN meetings to discuss further and come up with an action plan. But all of these things will be in the PQS or next year prescribing quality scheme. And we're particularly going to focus on patients on combinations of dependence forming medicines who are at much higher risk of accidental overdose. Um, and these broad spectrum antibiotics, which some of the PCN pharmacists have actually managed to get into some of the um, outlying practices and are working on the action plans with the GPs there, which seems to be going quite well. So that's that's a good thing. Um, Happy to take questions. Are there any questions for Michael? Um, I've, I've got one question. Is, is okay. on your last table where you're talking about the outlying practices and you mentioned um, a couple of practices that, you know, the actual actions they're taking, you know, like for Swatham and Downham and Bridge yes. Street. Um, so what's happening with the other ones like Burnham and Litcham, um, Theatre Royal and with the Waters? I can get you an update. It's the CSU team who um, sort of work in those areas and work with the PCN pharmacists. We are um, we do have meetings with PCN pharmacists, although they're kind of arm's length to us as such, and a lot of them have been um, um, seconded into the vaccination program, which some of them are, are fairly happy about, and some of them finding a bit stressful, has to be said. So their their work is kind of a little bit on hold. Um, I I'll try and get you a um, a list of actions perhaps for next month or in between um, and, uh, and find out what's actually happening. Certainly um, the top practice has been resistant to um, anybody going in to do any auditing um, historically, but we're working on that. Um, I'll get you some detail on that, Chair. Thank you very much. It's, it's just really, you know, if it's, it, it's, it's about being doing the right thing for the patients. And, yes. um, and I think that's that's the important thing, isn't it? Cathy, mm -hmm. um, did you want to come in? Yes, thank you. Um, Michael, I wondered, would we have an update on the oral nutritional supplement um, project in due course? Because I seem to recall in the midst of time, there were quite significant impacts for patients from um, changes to that. That's a good question. Because um, we, um, yeah, we, in, in the past, I've, I've often used that as a theme. Um, our dietetics team are working on it and have a, um, and are coming up with an indicator for next year's PQS and they do work with practices. I'll get a, a report on that for next month, but they are, it's something they're doing in the background. Certainly it is a, a cost pressure for us. So year on year, um, our spend on oral enteral feeds has gone up, um, which may be COVID related. Um, and, uh, you know, as an alternative to foodstuffs uh, effectively. So they're, they're trying to get to the bottom of that and looking at outlying practices. I will get you an update on that one next month as well. We'll do a full report. Thank you. Any other questions, Michael? 
John? Yeah, thank you. Michael, it's just going back to some extent to, to the point that Doris raised as well about the, the individual practices that you've highlighted around antibiotics. My, my recollection was that similar practices actually were towards the top of the list in terms of the dependence forming medications as well. So it, it, is this symptomatic of a lack of engagement with CCG support? Um, and if so, is there anything else that we can do corporately, I suppose, to try and help with that? I think, yes, it is historically. Um, the, the one at the top on the antibiotic list, um, a, a couple of, um, there has been some movement in the, in some of the GPs there. And I think um, the PCN pharmacists are having more discussions around that. And we were just discussing that with the clinical directors um, and our approach on how we um, help support practices who are outliers and they were quite keen that um, perhaps I, I sort of um, lead on giving the information about where they sit and that the clinical directors offer helpful support rather than the clinical directors being seen as the um, you know in any way policing their um, colleagues within their PCN because of um, they rely on um, you know clinical relationship which is only appropriate so we're a plan is being developed. We only just met a short while ago um, on, on some of these issues and how they plan to deal with them. But um, it, yeah, but it is quite a thorny issue. Yeah, it has been for a long time. Thank you. Maybe, maybe we, we can receive a little bit more detail on that offline, Michael, and then okay. just yep. understand what, what range of support we might be able to give. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, Karen, did you want to come in? Uh, thank you, Doris. Yes, it was just to say, Michael, very happy for the um, senior nurses to be involved in, in any support within primary care or any visits associated yeah. with the prescribing elements. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments from anybody? Is... No, th thank you very much, Michael. We look forward to the next iteration next month. Um, I think we now have a um, presentation on uh, the recovery and restoration planning. Um, I'm going to take that if I may, Doris. Yep, thank you. Thank you, and um, thanks for sharing the slides, Sarah. Um, so um, since we last met, um, the guidance has been published for um, the uh, operational planning for the NHS. Um, so this this presentation, whilst called recovery and restoration, is is it also incorporates some of the operational planning elements, and it is it's very high level. Um, we will be working through this over the coming um, days. Um, and we will, of course, um, bring a further update to the next um, committee meeting. If you could go to the next slide, please, Sarah, when you're ready. Thank you. So um, we've laid out here and we will share this um, this presentation with you all um, after the meeting. Um, the national priorities here um, are laid out and the specific one relating to general practice is the bullet point highlighted in red there? Um, but of course, all of the other um, all of the other priorities uh, for the NHS will also touch on and involve um, general practice um, through the work that we do. So um, for primary care, it's largely around continuing the work that we were doing pre-pandemic to expand the capacity in primary care. Uh, to improve access, to improve health outcomes and to and um, very importantly always, but particularly so after the last year to address uh, health inequalities. Um, and, and our settlement for this year has largely been focused on the first six months um, of the year. So the planning guidance is really asking us largely to focus on um, April to the end of, of September. And in terms of our timeframes, we will um, be putting draft plans in early in May um, and then we'll have a further month to continue to, to refine those following feedback from regional colleagues. We'll go to the next slide, please, Sarah. Thank you. Um, 
so I mean, as as you will know, the long term plan committed to um, a, a real terms increase in expenditure on primary medical services and on community services. Um, and um, the, the guidance that has been released recently just further builds on that um, commitment. Um, and we've included a link there to the planning guidance and um, all the stuff around primary care is on page 14 when you get a chance um, to read it. Next one, please. So what we're really pleased about this time is that as we work with um, NHS England um, around our approach to recovery and restoration of services, um, whereas in the summer last year when we were looking at um, restoration, as it was called at that point, um, actually the primary care element of that was was managed quite separately um, to the rest of the system. And, I, and so I think it's a really good thing that we're looking at recovering the system as a whole, particularly when we think about the, the risk in our risk register around um, the interface between primary and secondary care. Um, so, um, you know, we we also need to build on the transformation work that's happened over the last year. Services transformed literally overnight. And if we think about um, the amount of um, uh, digital transformation that happened as well. I think there's a real opportunity to build on that as we um, plan for, for this financial year. So the, thinking about health inequalities, the key priorities that, that come through in the guidance are around focusing on um, risk stratification, particularly around people with long term conditions, um, recovering screening and immunisations, um, and um, in actual fact, general practice in Norfolk and Waveney has done an absolutely phenomenal job with children's immunisations and keeping those at a really high level at or above um, above target. So they've done fantastically well. And then obviously the discussion we've had earlier about learning disabilities, but also thinking about severe mental illness health checks and recovering those and me mental health. Um, and we've also recently seen the introduction of the new community pharmacy consultation service, which is um, whereby now GPs can um, refer directly to um, a pharmacist in the community pharmacy. Um, and Michael's team uh, are leading on that and working um, with some pilot PCNs in our patch. And again, that's about expanding the capacity and expanding access to primary care as a whole. Next one, please. So this is just a bit of a visual um, that's come um, through from NHS England. So if we think about expanding capacity in, um, in general practice, um, we have the additional roles reimbursement scheme, which I think primary care networks found incredibly difficult to recruit to um, last year in the height of the pandemic um, when they were going up full throttle um, and it was really difficult to bring people into that environment. So there's going to be a, a new renewed focus on um, the additional roles um, and recruitment around that, plus really getting PCN development um, off the blocks again and I think um, PCNs will really be able to build on the work that they've done through the vaccination programme which has galvanised um, uh, most of the PCNs into a very different way of working and the IIF there that stands for Improvement and Investment Fund and again this is a new part of the, the general practice contract um, linked into PCNs and um, learning disability health checks is a part of that as well. So the PCN as a whole, um, their whole performance is measured at the end of the financial year. Um, and if they have met a target as a whole, then they are um, rewarded for that. It's a very similar scheme to the quality and outcomes framework, but it, it's for the PCN as opposed to an individual practice. Um, if we think about our training hub and our workforce um, uh, planning team, 
then um, they've largely been redeployed this year, but they are, are already starting to plan um, for how to um, restart some of the schemes that we had, which were really successful pre-pandemic in, um, in attracting and retaining our workforce. Um, and as part of improving access, um, which is moving more towards PCN delivery over the coming year, we also will be um, doing um, further work on our digital and telephony um, areas, working with practices, and Anne Heath's team is leading on that. That, of course, is all underpinned by um, our um, focus on tackling health inequalities, and our, our very own Tracy Williams on the, the committee um, is um, our, has been leading some fantastic work um, with our most vulnerable communities and, and um and the homeless, for example. And of course, the COVID vaccination programme continues. Um, we, uh, we have um, most, all of our practices really, bar one or two, have been um, involved in an absolutely phenomenal programme. And I won't steal Fiona's thunder because she's going to give us an update on this. But now we're starting the planning for the under 50s. Um, and how we how we take that forward. This is this continues to be a priority for the NHS as a whole. Next one, please, Sarah. So I, I'm not going to go through this um, in great detail because there's a lot on the slide, but we'll leave you to read it um, when you have the the pack. And of course, we'll publish this on the website as well. But on the left hand side, around. Um, workforce you'll see these are some of the national um figures that we're um we're dealing with here and um and, and our targets around increasing the workforce increasing the numbers of appointments across the new workforce and continuing to develop um the the offer in general practice which is widening for example to include social prescribing and care coordinators which I think have been really, really welcome roles in general practice. Next one, please. So um, by the end of this quarter, um, we'll, we'll need to set out in, in our plans how we will um, deliver um, the NHS priorities and what our governance arrangements are. Um, what some of the numbers are that we need to be measured on and and for primary care that's largely around workforce um and um and social prescribers for example um with much of our um planning being a narrative plan and we'll we will of course bring that um bring that here um, but we also want to build on um some of the work that we've been doing to really increase the collaborative working in in um, primary and community services, remembering that one of the big drives through the development of PCNs was dissolving the um, organisational boundaries between primary and community care. And I think, we, you know, initially we'll be um, looking probably at care homes with that, because that um, that if we think about multidisciplinary approach um, to how we work, um, then care homes has to be one of our um, one of our greatest priorities within that. Are there any more slides, Sarah? No, that's the no, last that's one. The last Thank one. you. I thought so. Just checking. Um, so I know that's quite a quick canter through and it's still very um, high level, but we will be bringing um, plans to the committee as they're drafted um, for you to review and feed into. You're muted, Doris. The first one to start this time. time. Um, um, it's good, it's good to see the outline plan and um, no doubt we'll get information as we go along. Are there any questions for Sadie based on that canter through of her slides? No. Um, and, and I assume the, the work 
um, going forward in terms of care homes, you know, we're going to be working with our local authority co colleagues as well. Um, Absolutely. To have a holistic approach to um, residents and families. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, if there's no questions for Sadie, we'll move on to the um, next item, which is the learning disability and um, health check, which um, Pardy, Pardy, you're going to take this one and probably add on yes. to. Yes, I am. Thank, thank you, Doris. Sure. So, so Sadie's covered a, a lot of it um, under the, the, the risk reporting. So I, I won't go um, go through the report. I'll just give you the highlights. So obviously, the target for this year is 67%. As of Q3, so you've got two tables. So table one is the data that we receive from NHS England directly from the CQRS system, which is where the practices input their LD uh, numbers on the numbers of uh, LD patients on their register and the number of completed health checks. So that's showing at quarter three a performance of 33%. And then the second table is what our own internal BI team pulls, and that's showing a performance of 49%. Uh, as I said, Q, Q4 data from NHS England normally comes through at the end of June, early July, but it's highly unlikely that we've, we've achieved anywhere near the 67% due to some of the reasons that we talked about earlier on. And then you've just got an O4 slide uh, in terms of the number of LD patients they've received the, the COVID vaccination. So first doses were just over 71% and second doses were just over five, five and a half percent. There is considerable work still ongoing around data cleansing and coding. Uh, and it's something that we haven't taken uh, in the last 12 months because of the pandemic, we just haven't had the capacity as we have in the past. But for the last couple of years, we've done a lot of work around data cleansing. But it still continues to be an issue and more recently we've picked up on historical uh, codes going back to 30 years ago where patients have been coded with an LD code uh, and they aren't LD patients so again we're working with our IT colleagues and how do we get those historical codes removed but as it stands at the moment we're, 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 the, the risk is that we're not likely to achieve 67 percent by the end of this quarter. Thank you, Sadie. Are there, are there, oh, sorry, Pauline. Um, um, are there any questions for Pauline? Um, Bill? Yes, thanks. I, I'm particularly interested in this issue of the IT because this is identified. I know we've had um, we have COVID upon us, but it's been identified for a while. And and I, you know, is it really that difficult a job to do? Or has it just been a low priority? Because I think that if the practices could tidy up their own um, lists by being able to amend it and make it accurate, I mean, and also if it can't be amended. I, I imagine that um, you know we people are having the same conversations with the same people as each new person looks at the incorrect data. So I, I you know, it must be immensely frustrating for everybody. Um, and is it's not a not a brand new problem. It, surely it must be something that we can address fairly straightforwardly. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll answer it in two parts. So the, the the latest coding issue around historical 30 years ago uh, incorrectly coded patients that's only come to light recently, and the practices cannot correct that data. They can't take the code off. Hence why we're liaising with our IT colleagues on um, what, what the next steps should be and for them to advise us on how, how those codes can be removed. So the, the data and the register for that practice with LD patients is, is accurate. The two main errors that we have around coding is the numbers on the LD register per practice, and that's a manual entry. Um, so it's not drawn from any clinical system. It literally is a manual entry by the practice. So instead of typing 20, they could type in 30 when they only have 20 patients. And it doesn't get picked up until we get the, the data because it shows there's a disparity between the number of health checks they've carried out and the number on the register. Or they have zero on the register and they've carried out 20 health checks. Now, they only get paid for completed health checks because that's pulled through from the clinical system. It is constantly the same uh, data issues and it almost is a full time job for my team 
to ring ground 105 practices to try and get them to have a look at their data and correct it. But it just seems to be one of these things that we just haven't been able to crack over the last couple of years. So we might get one practice that's performing well and the next one deteriorates. It just seems to be constant data. We've, we've carried out training. We've done some uh, easy read notes. Uh, there's coding issues. So the national um, recording codes change periodically. So that causes confusion. So it, it, it's a lot of work at the moment. And yes, it's frustrating, but it's something we just have to keep chipping away at. I, I hear what you say, that it, it as currently it's taking up a lot of time with your team. But surely rather than um, continually try to uh, tidy up something, can we look at the other end of it? Reporting on number of health checks completed. And again, we're still having issues in terms of just the completion of a simple spreadsheet. Okay, I mean, I, I won't, I won't labour this point because I know everybody's very busy, but I just, I just think that um, it, even if we were to rank those who perform really well at this task and those who don't, that might have an effect. Um, and I, I appreciate the um, frustration in in the various practices about the endless amount of data they're asked to produce. Um, so I, you know, I, I quite understand that another form or something else is not something that's popular um, in the in the practices. But um, uh, you know, if if it's the same parish uh, practices doing this, the same thing that's causing extra expense with your team, then, then couldn't we pull a list out of the, the 10 worst offenders and give them more focus and not uh, and leave the leave the other ones? And I'm, you know, I don't know whether there'd be the same offenders on other issues or not, um, or whether this is a, um, a specific, a, a separate issue from uh, others. Um, but anyway, um, I. I, I feel your pain, Parveen, but I, I think there must be a way of us addressing the cause rather than just spending months tidying up every time in a sort of Groundhog Day way when the, the same, everything that you've corrected for the previous month goes wrong again the following month. Thanks, Bill. John, do you want to come in on that or something different? It, it was a different angle, actually, but um, I, I'll agree with Holy Grail, isn't it? Trying to make sure we've got good, accurate information to report on, so any incentive to support that would be good. But um, the point I wanted to make was it, it's about variation, I suppose. So recognise very significant um, impact on all practices of the pandemic, but notwithstanding that, there's there's a big variation across North and Wavy in terms of take up with um, with LD health checks. So our, our data from the BI team for Q three shows the great Arthur and Wayne who actually achieved 62 percent reduces to 40 percent in Norwich and 32 percent in West Norfolk so West Norfolk only half as many as in Great Yarmouth and Waveney that that's a very significant difference across the patch so I'm just wondering if there's any particular reason for that um and is there learning also from Yarmouth and Waveney in this particular case North Norfolk not far behind is there learning that canon should be spread across other parts of North and Waveney okay so um the, the pattern that you've just um, identified is, is no different to pre-COVID. So West uh, locality or West CCG as it was at that time have always been very poor performing around data and carrying out physical health checks. And we have done a lot of training and the quality team has also done some uh, a lot of bite-sized training sessions with them. And we don't seem to have cracked it in terms of improving their performance. Great Yarmouth and Waverley has always been one of our better performing areas um, and I think maybe I don't want to blow my team's trumpet but it's because we were based in Beckles so we had a closer relationship with the Great Yarmouth and Waveney practices and got around to individual practices to do some more one-to-one -one work with them so they've always been I'm not saying they're perfect we have a number of Great Yarmouth and Waveney practices but literally on one hand that are poorly performing whilst most of them have actually pushed the boat out um, so a lot of them are, are moving forward, but the, the pattern that you've identified, John, that, that was no different to pre-COVID West. We just can't seem to crack it that they, the practices overall, the majority of them are very poorly performing. So I suppose it just raised the question about what, what more do we need to do on that? Because presumably, well, question I suppose, are, are the outcomes there for uh, patients with learning disabilities in the west of the county much worse than they are for patients in the east of the county? And if so, we really ought to be doing something to address that. 
I absolutely agree with you, but at the moment they, they're getting the impact investment fund, they're getting the primary care support fund. The money is not an issue, so it can't be financial financial incentives because they are getting enough in terms of financial incentives. Um, and the peripatetic team will be another resource to help deliver um, the outcomes that's required for each locality. But at the end of the day, the practices have got to focus on completing the health checks in a timely manner. And again, we, we have worries where things are left to the last quarter because it's a mandated target for the CCG. It's not mandated for practices, so they can opt out. It doesn't need the CCG enough recovery time if we leave all activity to the last quarter. OK, it's, it's all sorry, I won't hold, hold the question, but um, it's also another worry that if, if it is the last quarter again, if we've had particularly low uptake in the year that's just finished, and it's another year effectively before patients get seen. It's going to be at least two, if not three, four, five years between checks. And again, as a non-clinician, I would worry about the, the risk, clinical risk associated with that. But um, no, I absolutely agree with you, John. We need to think of something else to do because um, we, we were sort of exhausting all avenues at the moment. Um, Hein and then James. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to build on what Bill said earlier, and I wholeheartedly agree with everything he said. So my request would be at the appropriate time, whether it's May or June or July, could um, could you come back to the committee with sort of the learnings from the data cleansing? Because uh, the, the paper says it's 2000, maybe at the end of the day it's 800 or whatever it is. Because I think there's a bigger lesson, not just for LD, but, but for other features as well. And it seems imminently solvable it's a matter of putting the right resource on it and it's it's ridiculous that Parveen and our team have to chase what ought to be solved at source um so maybe we could use it as a test case so what what would it need um, does it need incentive schemes or whatever to to get this right because this has real life impact so um that would be my request and i'll leave it to Parveen what the right time in the new financial year is for that Thanks, Hein. I mean, my, my personal view is in this day and age, we shouldn't be doing manual data entry when things could be automated, but that might be um, a step too far in NHS IT systems. But let's not go down that route. <laughs> James? Yeah, could I comment on a couple of things? So first of all, in terms of the LD take up, um, you know, we've had the benefit of working with somebody who's working with um, uh, the um, hard to reach communities and the whole problem as I said before, is that if practices are reaching out and trying to grab people, then it is very much a white coat method. And the work that we have to do is about building rapport and liaison and becoming part of these people's lives so in such a way that they ask to come to the practice for the health checks. Otherwise, you're going to get year after year of failure to take up rates because it's really hard. You put a, a lot of appointments and then the person thinks, I don't want to come and they're entitled to think that so we need to persuade them so we need to do more persuasion on the aspect of data entry and naming and shaming i think that would have a negative effect there's 108 practices um i would invite anybody interested in data collection to come and observe for a day or two how data is coming in the confusion over the codes trying to train um um, a workforce where there is no training course available, there's no NHS administration or bureaucracy or data, you have to piece it together. So 108 practices have to piece together their data entry, gathering, write their own policies and then try and deliver a day-to-day -day service. So I think there is a role for some kind of centralised training and support system. I'd love to send my staff every year for a day or two training on the latest data entry where do I send them? I can't. So that is the big issue that we have. It's impossible to get system one training and it's impossible to create um, a workforce that is appropriate in data entry. In, in essence, I have to advertise for Aviva staff and spend three months training them on NHS bureaucracy. See, it's, it's the only way. And that is going to lead to confusion, black holes and data gaps. If that's OK, sorry. Thanks, James. Karen, do you want to come in? Uh, yes, please, Doris. Thank you. I'm very much feeding on to what James has, has um, spoken about. I just wonder whether we've got the right model and we need to be engaging with our learning disability population to have a look at what model would encourage them to come into primary care. It's 
to be able to have their appointments. We know that when we've worked and we've engaged with our learning disability community, they've often said it's about having um, more time, it's about the right um, environment. So I very much think there's a piece there that we should be doing around engagement. Thank you, Karen. Bill, did you want to come back in? Yes, I, I'm very interested in James's point, actually, because, you know, as a system uh, looking forward about how we're going to target our resources and reduction in inequalities, if we can't identify them accurately, then how do we know that we're achieving one of our main goals and focuses going forwards? So maybe um, a piece of work around data inputting and supporting the practices to do that correctly and some training though it's not a direct clinical intervention, might actually make it uh, easier for us to effectively use our clinicians uh, in a much more targeted way. Um, and, you know, if, you know, if that is the practical experience in the practices, I think it's, it's something that we should consider as a system. Thanks, Bill. Tracy? I mean, I, I was going to say sort on two fronts in respect of the data, I think certainly you could do some targeting work, you know, looking at within PCN kind of sharing that kind of supporting each other with that data and having a, a data team that could perhaps look at that so support that approach. But in respect of kind of engagement with our, um, you know, our patients have a learning disability, I really think we may need to be quite innovative in our approaches. So, you know, people they trust, people they're working with we're sometimes not the right people actually to be, you know, contacting people and bringing them into appointments. We need to look at new and different ways of reaching people because it is about engagement and it's about trust. So I think, you know, hopefully the parapatic team can do some of that work, but I think we shouldn't be afraid to maybe target specific areas of the county, Norfolk and maybe where we need to as well. Because in fact, if the uptake is really low in some areas, we've just got to, you know, be, be prepared to kind of put resources where they're needed, I think. Thank you. Um, Pauline? Thank you, Doris. Um, so I just wanted to go back to, to James's point um, and just generally around data training and the, the quality of the data. So we, we have produced some some, um, some clinical guidelines done by uh, our colleagues in the quality team. And we've also produced some guidance around coding uh, and how to input the, the data. So that is available on Knowledge Anglia, so all practices should have an access, access to it. I think the, the issue is that because there has been so much change since the merger of the, um, the five CCGs and, 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 and the pandemic, we, we've had a meeting with colleagues recently to look at everything that we've produced over the last couple of years and try and bring it back together and to perhaps look at relaunching it. In terms of um, what do the LD community want? So again, we've produced some, what does a gold standard health check look like? A, a health check, uh, an LD health check passport. Um, and th those were produced uh, in engagement with the LD community and opening doors, uh, which, which work with a lot of the, the LD patients. And again, those literatures are available within practices. Um, we have electronic versions on Knowledge Anglia. So again, I think it's about Perhaps we need to just relaunch, rebadge, uh, relook at everything, and then 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 relaunch it because a lot of work has been done, but it just doesn't seem to be joined up at the moment. It just seems to have some some parts of it seems to have got missed as the CCG merged and, and people's job roles have changed. Thank you. It's probably a good good bit of work to do as part of um, all the revamping and um, that we. are you and the team are looking at as well. Um, I think I might draw that discussion, um, animated discussion to a close so that we move on to the next item, um, which is an update on the vaccination programme. Um, is Fiona taking us through that one? Hello Chair, thank you. Yes, I will. Um, Sarah, if you could, thank you. Um, so this is, um, I think, it, you know, a never more um, increased uh, good news story for the CCG um, and how well we're doing in this respect. Um, Sarah, if you'd like to go on to the next slide, please. Um, so this is the list of um, PCN sites 
Um, there are no changes at the moment, but um, we anticipate there might be changes coming up and I'll um, talk about them in a minute. Um, but I think we also need to highlight um, the work that's being done with the vaccination centres, um, which are being run across the, um, the system as well um, and how successful they are running um, and together with the hospital hubs. Um, next slide, please. So this is um, a quick update um, where we are as of yesterday. Um, um, sorry, I should say as of early April, 93% um, of the over 50s have received their first dose of vaccine, which I think is absolutely fantastic. It means that uh, we're fourth out of the 42 healthcare systems um, in England. Um, and in terms of care homes, we've vaccinated 97% of the residents, of course, those um, under 60. Um, and the PCN teams, um, through their roving models um, and through the sites, are also um, vaccinating those who are under the age of 60. So those in um, learning disability homes, those living in supported living accommodation, um, and um, those types of places. So we're making really good progress. Um, and of course, we're now starting to see a real rapid um, increase in the number of second doses um, that are happening. Um, our work in terms of looking at health inequalities, um, addressing um, those groups um, who may feel um, they can't come to a PCN site, um, sorry, come to a, set, a site, um, and those who perhaps are um, have vaccine hesitancy, there's a huge amount of work going on um, in this area. Um, and we're able to, and this is all supported by some um, very good detailed modelling down to um, S MSOA level by deprivation, um, ethnicity, we can break down the data, um, for example, um, to look at those with learning disabilities or severe mental health illness um, or um, other categories of patients um, such as asylum seekers and refugees as well. Um, and by um, breaking down the data, this is also helping to us to work out what we can do to actually support and increase the uptake in these groups. Um, walking clinics um, are one aspect of this which has been used recently in the past few weeks um, and those are provided across um, the CCG area um, and I've just named some of the sites that are, um, are open this week um, in Attleborough, Kings Lynn, Down and Market, Lowestoft and Halston. Um, and there is also the work that's going on, obviously linking back to um, looking at health inequalities with roving teams working with homeless charities and organisations using um, clinics in hostels. Um, and this has been hugely successful. And I think yesterday we vaccinated 32 people with the support of Emmaus. Um, we're due to go live with a roving bus model this week. Um, and again, that will link back to the data modelling that we're doing and really following the data to inform where we need to go. Um, so um, we've been talking to faith groups um, and we anticipate that the bus will be used outside the mosque, um, looking at areas of deprivation, um, initially in Great Norwich and Great Yarmouth, but this will be extended and also looking at other sites um, and other places that we can um, put, pitch the bus at. Um, and all this planning will be going on over the next few weeks or so. Um, recently, um, all the PCN sites were asked to um, um, advise us whether they wish to continue vaccinating. Um, and um, all have uh, agreed that they want to continue with this um, this program um, and supporting the vaccination program. Um, a, one PCN site um, will be um, choosing to opt out 
um, of delivering vaccines to those um, age under 50. But we already have um, alternative provision in place um, through community pharmacy sites in neighbouring PCN areas, um, uh, large vaccination sites um, and access to Norwich. So we're comfortable um, that that provision um, will be um, covered um, and that patients will have um, easy access to other sites. Um, and our communication teams are regularly updating the communications and engagement plans um, almost on a daily basis as news comes through. And I think the good news story um, for today is that we are allowed to move to vaccinate um, the patients um, individuals aged over 45 years. Um, they We will start um, with those aged 49 and gradually work backwards um, through the age group um, over the coming days. And that'll be supported nationally by text programme. But individuals will be able to go to uh, any of the vaccination sites or um, primary care sites. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we continue to um, identify some issues and risks um, the successful delivery of vaccines is linked to the supply um, and it would be fair to say that has been lower for first, first doses during, um, during the course of this month. We expect to see um, increased um, vaccine supplies at the end of this month, um, but all second dose um, vaccine supplies are confirmed and available. So individuals should have no concerns about whether that they will actually get a second dose if it's due in the next few weeks. Um, one of the changes that's come through recently in the past week is the guidance from the um, MHRA and JCBI around the use of AstraZeneca vaccine um, for the under 30s. Um, at the moment, um, that guidance applies to um, individuals who are care workers, who may be clinically um, extremely vulnerable. But obviously what we need to do is to start planning for how um, the individuals in that, um, in that group can be vaccinated um, later in the year when we can do so. And obviously um, the rollout of any additional vaccines um, may help to support this. Um, I think it's important to note that the PCN sites have done a um, huge amount of work. Their staff have been um, absolutely brilliant, supported by um, a um, by staff from other areas, from other organisations, and of course the volunteer workforce. <laughs> and the most of them are very enthusiastic to keep going. But of course, this is also um, at the same time as that uh, services are being asked to um, restore and recover um, and open up more to, to patients, um, as was discussed um, earlier in the meeting. And of course, this has an impact on the workforce sustainability. Um, so we'll be watching all these, um, all this very carefully over the next few weeks. Um, Next slide. Um, so yes, so in terms of next steps, um, we are obviously the news today that we can open up to 45 and over, um, and then we need to start planning for um, other age groups. Um, in terms of the roving bus model, um, we want to start looking at other areas, um, and we've already identified Kings Lynn and Thetford as potential sites. Um, and um, the daily reporting and weekly reporting um, continues through to um, the um, internal um, and regional governance groups. Um, and I think that um, completes the presentation, but if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to um, take them. Thank you. Thank you for your updates. It's really good to see the um, all the you know the good work that's being done um, 
and it's actually you know I think you all need to be congratulated on so actually achieving the percentage is kind of really quite amazing um, especially given you know the sort of older higher percentage of older population in Norfolk and Waveney as well so I think well done to you all. Um, Parveen? Thanks Doris. Um, thanks, Fiona. It was just a, a heads up because you mentioned uh, the, the bus going to faith groups and the, the mosque. I, I don't know whether you're aware, but Ramadan started today. And I don't know whether the CCG under its addressing health inequalities has produced anything around um, there's no nutrients in the vaccine, so it's perfectly safe for people to have it whilst they're fasting, though you might get some people that might not feel comfortable, but it's just how, how we manage that message. Um, if, I, if I respond quickly, um, maybe Karen will uh, add to this if I missed anything, but guidance has been miss, uh, has been prepared um, for sites around Ramadan and um, obviously the vaccine as well. Um, we are also talking to sites um, across the system, so that's all sites, about their plans for introducing, um, I suppose, early evening twilight um, vaccination um, opening um, and obviously talking to the communities as well to find out what they feel that they would like and what they want. Um, Karen, I don't know whether there's anything you'd like to add to that. So it was exactly that. Thank you, Fiona. And it was really acknowledging that if people are fasting and they're concerned that they may feel faint afterwards or have to break their fast, it is about having that flexible model in place. So there's some really good guidance that that's come down regionally that that has gone out and I think that was out either yesterday or a few days ago. Thank you Fiona. And it's really good to hear that you I think it was on the news this morning about faith leaders um, coming out very strongly to say the Ramadan doesn't stop people taking up the vaccine as well and, and, and I think that's a really good message to hear. Um, Tracy? I mean, I was going to add to that. So we do have a, an overall um, COVID vaccination inequalities oversight group and then various smaller groups that look in particular, you know, inclusion health groups as well as other other kind of areas. So we're certainly being very flexible with the plans around that and certainly engaging very much with communities through the health equity partnership work. So understanding what those concerns are and making sure that through our voluntary community sector organisations, that information really gets out to communities in a very timely and we can kind of address any, any concerns. So that, that is happening and we've been very flexible in our approaches. Are there any other questions or comments? No, thank you very much for the update, Fiona. Um, look forward to the next exciting instalment of increasing uptake. It's, it's really good to see. Um, are there, um, we'll move on to any other business. I am not aware of any questions from the public unless anything's come in whilst we've been talking. I take silence as no. Um, so I th thank you all very much for your time this afternoon. Um, it's uh, just before three o'clock.